Okay, if you'd like to take your seats, let's go straight into the book of Revelation. Let's go to chapter 21, where we left off last time. Revelation chapter 21. And can we go to verse 14? Revelation 21, verse 14. And we'll read down to verse 19 or 20. So, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we're looking at the city of God, specifically the foundations tonight. So these foundations is what's going to be described. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald. I think we'll stop there. So, if you remember last time, we looked at aspects of the city, some aspects. And if you remember last year, we looked at the city all year. So you're all experts on the city of God, yeah? But we're looking at some aspects at, at, about it that we didn't study during the year. So it's pretty important, this city. Would you agree? Not only is it mentioned all the way through the Bible, but it's the ultimate um, objective and destination for you. Yeah? I mean, come on, some of you, you spend more time on your house than anything else in life, and you're not going to live there forever. This is a place you're going to live forever. You know, we can spend hours a day just sorting out our house. This is our eternal home, our eternal destination. So it's important that we understand uh, the aspects that God's talking about it. Now, can you just put up that first PowerPoint, please, uh, Chris? If you remember last time, I said I wasn't going to go into detail about what all these were. And I still thought I went into a bit of detail. But apparently... Someone who knows me very well says I didn't explain it very well. She said, they said. <laughs> they says, but what does this mean and what does that mean? Well, I can't go through every single meaning and every single colour of every single jewel that's mentioned there in the foundations. And they're repeated in the Old Testament having different um, understandings. Um, so I'm not going to do that, but every jewel does mean something, yeah? And I, I looked at some aspects uh, of that. We looked at Jasper, I think, in a little bit of detail. Now, I can't go through all this, but if you just look down the list, um, for example, if, if you go halfway down the list, the one that's got the most names there, um, number six on the stones in Revelation... It says ruby, yeah? Now, what does a ruby mean? Now, I, th I presume we think it's red, but apparently you can have different colored rubies. I I'm not so sure. But if you just think of in the Bible where ruby's mentioned, it will give you a clue as to what the meaning is. What does it mean? Now, what is a ruby? It's a foundation of God's city. So it has a meaning in the city of God. It's a picture of something important about God's city because it's listed there as the sixth foundation stone. So does the Bible talk about rubies? Yes. So what does it mean? Do you know, it usually is linked with a very specific meaning, a ruby. Let me give you an example. You'll know this as soon as I start telling it. Go to Proverbs 31. Proverbs chapter 31. Um... It's basically the last chapter of Proverbs. Go to verse 10. Some of you all probably already know what I'm going to say. A wife of noble character who can find she's worth far more than rubies. Yeah? A husband has full confidence in her and 
lacks nothing of value. What is the city of God as described by the angel? The bride. Yeah? Rubies are linked with a good wife. The wife, the bride of noble character, who can find? She's worth far more than rubies. Doesn't use another precious stone. It specifically links it to rubies. And if you go to other places, especially in Proverbs, go to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 15. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 15. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. She is more precious than rubies. The bride is worth more than rubies. So you'll notice that rubies is linked with a woman. Yeah? The bride of Christ is the city of God. The city of God is the bride that's worth more than rubies. The ruby is so important an aspect of it that it's one of the foundation stones the city is built on. So can you see, if you want to study all the jewels and all the meanings and all the different words, you can, you can do that, but we haven't got time to do that. We'd be here for hours. But it is linked, precious stones, this ruby is linked. Not all, all the precious stones are linked to different things. But ruby is linked to a good woman. The city of God is the bride of Christ. She's a very good woman. She's the perfect woman. She is the bride of noble character who can find. Jesus has finally found the perfect bride. God has got the perfect bride for the perfect son. The bride of Christ, the city of God. And that's why Rubies is there. It's, if you go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, New Testament. Go to verse 3. So, when Peter's describing precious jewels, he's, he's talking about a good bride, Yeah? Your beauty of a, of a good wife should not come about from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewellery or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfailing beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is great sight in God's worth. So there it says jewellery, but precious stones in, in other translations. So what, what we're told in the New Testament, that... The, the good bride, a good wife, her beauty doesn't come from outward adornment. It doesn't say you can't have outward adornment. Sometimes people have brought legalism in, saying, oh, that means you can't wear jewellery and have nice hairstyles. It doesn't say you can't have it. It says that isn't what makes you beautiful. Yeah? Let me tell you something, ladies. That isn't what makes you beautiful. What makes you beautiful is your inner spirit, right? Your outward adornment might attract a husband, but that isn't what will keep him. And a good husband isn't looking for that anyway. He's looking for the inner beauty, which is of great value in God's sight. So the, the bride in Revelation, the city of God, where does her inner beauty come from? The precious stones. No, no. The precious stones only refract the light that's shining within it. Yeah? The stones themselves don't give light. In the new Jerusalem, the, 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 the Jerusalem in heaven, the, the city of God that's coming down, there is no light except God. There's no sun, there's no moon. The light is Christ himself shining through the city. So the ruby sparkles along with the other precious stones, not because they're precious stones. It sparkles because God is in it. Because God lives within the city. Because the husband is one with the bride. Because God is in his people. That's where the beauty comes from, not the precious stones. The precious stones are pointless if there's no light shining through them. You won't even see them. If you ever go to a jeweler's, I can guarantee when they've got all these diamonds and sapphires, they'll have a very bright light shining on them, right? Because if you turn the light out, they don't look beautiful. They just look like any other rock. It's the light that gives them the beauty. The city of God, these things in the city of God, the stones represent things, but it's the light shining through them. You are beautiful because of Christ in you, 
the hope of glory, the light shining through you, yeah? So just go back to that chart then. So you can see, I'm not going to go through, I'm not going to go through them all, but if you just go back to that chart, you can see all, um, so you can see all the precious stones there, and they've all got meaning. Um, if you remember, and I didn't go too deep into this, but if you look on the far right where it says Satan's government, this is found in Ezekiel, it says Satan's system also has precious stones. Yeah? Have you noticed there's no ruby in Satan's government? You see, Satan brings a counterfeit of God's kingdom, but Satan hasn't got a bride. He wants one. He has a harlot. He has a prostitute. Um, and, and you'll find that in Revelation 17. Can we just go there? Revelation 17 and verse 4. So although there's a ruby in the foundation, God's bride's there, there's no bride in Satan's kingdom. There's just a prostitute. What's the difference between a prostitute and a bride? One is a relationship of love. The other one is just pay for hire. Yeah? Pretends to love as long as they get paid. All right? And Satan's harlot, the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones. Right? Satan's system tries to look like God's city. The false church tries to look like the true church, but it isn't. It's not a bride. It's a prostitute. It's whatever keeps them in a job. It's whatever gives them money. It's whatever gives them prestige or title. And sadly, we are seeing more and more of that in the Christian world. People who are occupying positions in churches and leaders and even on a national scale. And it's purely just to keep their titles and positions. It's not about a love relationship with Jesus Christ or bringing people into faith in Jesus Christ. They're even changing God's laws so that they can just put on an act of what the true church is, right? Satan counterfeits. So if we just go back to the chart, so many of these things, you'll, you'll, if you know your Bible, so for example, number nine, topaz. If you know, when, when God has a physical appearance of something, it's often described as looking like topaz. So when Ezekiel sees the, the theophany, the appearance uh, of God in Ezekiel chapter 116, it says that the throne and the appearance of God looks like topaz. When Daniel has an appearance of, of the glory of God and a man appears to him, it says his body is like topaz uh, there in Daniel 10. Uh, even in the Song of Songs, when, when uh, the, the, the lovers are describing this, they describe their body as being like topaz. So topaz is, is sort of a, a, a precious stone that emphasizes the reality of something. This is literal. This heavenly Jerusalem isn't just a, a mystical idea. It's a real place. It is a physical reality. Now, next time we might look at um, how do you know something is real, physically real? How, how do you know that? I don't know if you know, but the, the Nobel Prize for Physics for 2022, so last year's Nobel Prize, the highest you know, attainment of scientific endeavor for physics was a team of scientists, and they have proved, are you ready for this? They have proved scientifically and mathematically that the universe is not real. Now, you're laughing. They have proved it. Now, you might think, well, that's bonkers. Well, it's not, actually. Um, they have proved it. Now, if you actually study the universe and you work out through what's there, through gravity and mathematics and the mass of the universe, any true scientist will tell you 95% of it isn't there. It's not there. They call it dark matter or dark energy, something, you know. It's not there. Now, that, when we say it's not, it's not like playing hide and seek, it's not like hidden behind a moon, right? It literally isn't there. So it's got to be there because the mass and the gravitational math, the mathematics, I'm not an astrophysicist, but it's got to be there, but it's not. Now, if they'd read the Bible, they would know 
that most of what God's created is actually unseen. He created things, the visible and the invisible. God creates the universe. You see, the heavenly realms are probably a different dimension to what we understand. But they're there. They're real. 95%. So just remember, this is real. It's coming out of heaven. The heavenly realm is 95 times more real than anything you've ever experienced. And I think this is what um, the resurrection brings about and the, uh, the spiritual rejuvenation that happens at the end. This is what uh, it brings about. So, so Topaz sort of emphasizes that reality. That Topaz is in Satan's government. He's going to bring a real kingdom on earth. Satan. It's called Babylon. And so we can see that in, uh, in lots of these different uh, pictures of these precious Stones. Okay, so let's leave that one there. Let's go to the next one then. So we, we looked at the meanings of the names of the tribes, because you remember the gates, the access into this city were all those. And we looked at that each name, each of the precious stones was also linked to a tribe, but the foundations are not linked to the tribes. The foundations are linked to the 12 apostles. But each of the tribes had a literal name that had a literal meaning and we looked at that last time how all the meanings meant something and has a meaning for the city of God and how the tribes were named by the bride of Israel Jacob so it was Jacob's who who changed his name to Israel it was Jacob's wives that named the sons yeah and they're the access into the city so we looked at that last time so i'll not go into great detail there so if you can bring up the next one so we've just read that the 12 foundations that have the 12 stones the precious stones were named after the 12 apostles So just as the 12 tribes that we looked at last time had 12 names, you know the apostles had names, yeah? But there's a difference because Jesus changed their names. And you'll notice when you look at the apostles, they've got two names, most of them. In fact, I I probably think they all had two names. We just might not know what all the double names are. But you'll know in the Bible that when someone became a Christian, um, they often gave them another name. So Joseph became Barnabas, son of encouragement, Barnabas. Now, in a lot of cultures, especially in the East, they still do this. When you became a Christian, um, if, you, if you had a name, they, they gave you a Christian name. A lot of Libby's friends, in, a lot of the Chinese friends and Singaporean friends, they, they have two names. They have their original name and then the name they're given uh, when they become baptized and become a Christian. So these are the foundations of the place we're going. Now, I'm sure you could all quote the 12 names of all 12 apostles. The Canon Sunday School, the Canon Kids Church. And so I just wanted to look at this and I want us to try and see something because these are foundations. So if they're named after the, the 12 apostles, then they should have meanings because they're named after their names. Yeah, so just as the 12 tribes had meanings, the 12 apostles have meanings, but it's different. Right, let's just look at them. I'll just try and explain what some of the names mean. Um, So first one, you all know Simon, yeah? And Jesus renamed him Peter, which means rock. Can you remember what Simon meant, Shimon? I know you know. (laughs) Pretending you know Hebrew as well as me. (laughs) Shimon. Samuel, Shimuel, means heard of God, to hear from God. So, hears from God, Jesus calls him a rock. What's a rock? It's a foundation. On this rock I will build my church, yeah? So the first apostle that knows who Jesus is, Jesus says that's a foundation, yeah? That's a foundation. You've got something now on which God can build because you've heard Shimon and you have 
now been renamed as a rock, and you only build on a rock. Jesus himself told that in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't build on sand, build on the rock. Make sure you've got a, a right foundation. Now, sometimes we're told what the name of their father is. And often if we're not told what the name of their father is, we're told where they come from. Now, Peter's father and, and Andrew, because they were brothers, their dad's name was John. Anyone know what John means? Grace, yes. I actually mean God's grace, grace of God. Yohanan. Hanan is grace. Yah is the name for God. So he's someone who hears from God. He's now got a foundation, and he's got it through the grace of God because he comes from John. Some King James will say uh, son of Jonah, but it's, it's really John. Uh, next one then is Andrew, who was Simon's brother. So whether he was renamed, we're not quite sure. Obviously, he comes from God. Comes from, it's through the grace of God. Andrew means manly in Hebrew. Okay, next one, James. Now, James is Greek. It is the Greek way of saying the Hebrew Jacob. It might sound strange. You think, well, that doesn't sound anything like Hebrew or they sound different names, but that's, that's literally what it means. James is Yaakov, James, Jacob. Jesus renamed him Boanerges with his brother John, which means son of thunder. They came, their father, so they came from a man called Zebedee, which means um, gift of God. Zebedee, it means gift from God or a gift of God, right? So we've got these coming from grace, coming from gift of God. John means grace or God's grace. He's also renamed a son of thunder and he comes from Zebedee, gift of God. Now, as I go through, you might notice a pattern. You might not. Next one, Philip. Philip comes from phila, phila um, which is Greek for love. He comes from Bethesda, which means house of fish. Uh, we don't know his father's name. Uh, Phil Hip, actually. Uh, hip means horse. So Phil Hip means someone who loves horses. Yeah. Hippopotamus, hip, means horse. Potamus means river. So a river horse is called a hippopotamus. Next one. Bar, Bartholomew. Bar means son. Uh, Ptolemy. You know, you've heard of Cleopatra? She was a Ptolemy. She was from the Ptolemaic dynasty, uh, from the, 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 the Ptolemaic line of Egypt. So Bartholomew isn't really a name. It means the son of Ptolemy. So it's the son of his dad. Um, his name is Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Nathan means gift. El means God. And he was from Cana in Galilee. Next one. Thomas means twin. Didymus means twin. It's just different language, but it's the same name. Do you know why he was called the twin? Because he had a twin. <laughs> no. <laughs> be a bit unfortunate, your mum calling you twin, wouldn't it? What, she call them both twin? No, the, the tradition, we don't really know, but what, one of the ancient tradition, traditions is... He was so affected, because you remember he was the one who doubted. They said after he met Jesus, he became so much like Jesus, they called him the twin. That, now, that's a tradition, but it, it is quite an old tradition. They said, some people said he became so much like Jesus, they called him the twin, which is a, a very commendable uh, title. Next one. Matthew. Now, um, he's also called Levi, because that's probably where his tribe was from. So he's probably a Levite, but he was called M M Matthias, Matthew. Uh, he was from Galilee. Does anyone know what Matthew means? It means gift of God. Have you noticed something? Every other one's called gift of God. Next one. James, we've already seen that. That's the name. Um, uh, Yaakov, Jacob, 
just in Greek rather than Hebrew. He was a son of Alphaeus. Um, he was called James the Less to distinguish him from the other James, the son of Zebedee. So he was named after, after Israel, you know, after the people of God. So that's what his name means. The next one, uh, Thaddeus. Tha- Tha- Thaddeus, also called Judas. No wonder he changed his name. He was the son of James, son of uh, Yaakov, Israel. Deus, does anyone know what Deus means? God. Does anyone know what Thaddy means? Gift. They're all different ways. Matthew, Thaddeus, Nathaniel, Zebedee, they're all different language ways of saying the gift of God. This isn't an accident. Next one. Simon, Shimon, the zealot, don't know that much about him. He some, means he is someone who hears from God. And then the, the last one who's replaced is uh, Judas, which means praise in Hebrew. He's the son of Simon, son of Simon Iscariot. So someone who hears from God, someone who gives praise. Iscariot, Issa just means man. Kerioth means uh, it's a place, it's a city. So Kerioth means, Iscariot means the man from Kerioth. But he's replaced. He's replaced by the next one. He's replaced by Matthias. Guess what Matthias means? The gift of God. So, can you see in the names there's a pattern? They're either linked to grace, love, and then it's gift of God, love, gift of God, grace, gift of God, heard, gift of God, praise, gift of God. Yeah? Why? Well, if you know your Bibles, it's because the apostles are grace gifts given to the church from God. That's what they're called. So an apostle is some th- gift of grace. By the way, um, the, the Greek way of saying grace gift would be charis mata, grace gift given, Yeah. So charismatic means grace gift given to you. So a charismatic is someone who believes in the gifts that have been given to them through God's grace. That's why we're often called charismatics. And so Matthias is appointed to replace Judas. By the way, Iscariot, Judas seems to be the only one that didn't come from Galilee, as far as we know. So there's a clue that he was never from the right place in the, in the first Instance And so in Acts, Matthias, so you've got another gift of God. So you can see that Jesus, in picking the disciples or naming the disciples, is emphasizing, as well as grace, Yohanan, and as well as love, and as well as them belonging to Israel, like James, or praise, Judah, he's emphasizing that these are gifts that are given to the church. They're the foundational gifts. They are the gifts that God gives to the church on which the city of God, the church, is built upon. So they're pretty essential. Now today, unfortunately, the word apostle is abused massively. I do believe there are some ministries that still function in an apostolic way. I do believe that. But unfortunately, people now use it as a title and they just call themselves apostles, and I would say most people who call themselves apostles aren't. And even if they do have an apostolic ministry, it doesn't mean they're one of the 12. These are a very special, specific category of ministry gift. And so there's actually another apostle added. Does anyone know who he was, what he was called? Yeah, Saul of Tarsus. Now, he was added by God himself. Now, there are other people in the Bible called apostles, some of whom will travel with Paul, actually. But um, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. That was the last tribe in the other list. And I think God's showing us something by picking Saul of Tarsus and adding him as one of the foundations. Because if we didn't have Saul, we wouldn't have half the New Testament. 
And uh, Saul actually means, uh, Paul means small. Renamed himself small. And so he's picked by the bridegroom right at the end, just as Benjamin was named by the bridegroom right at the end of the tribes. Well, Benjamin is the only tribe not named by the, the bride. She was actually named by the bridegroom. And so you've got a pattern there. So remember, these are gifts of grace that God gives to us. All ministry gifts are, by the way. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They are gifts given to the church so that it can be built. They're foundational gifts. Now, everyone given to the church is a gift, yeah? You know, if you think of this building, every part of this building is important, isn't it? The chair you sat on is important. You're glad it's there. The carpet, the, the lights. We'd be in trouble without the lights, wouldn't we? We'd be in trouble if parts of this building weren't there. But we could sort of function without a lot of this stuff. But if we move the foundation, we haven't got a building. If you move the foundations, everything collapses. And it's important to always remember that when we're talking about charismata, when we're talking about the gifts that God gives. Because don't confuse gifting. Because if you do, you might think something's really important when it's not, and you might think something's not important when it's essential and it holds everything up. And sometimes we, we overvalue ancillary gifting and we undervalue foundational gifting. Jesus handpicked all these. No one picked these except God himself. Foundational gifting. Okay, so... If we go to the next chart, please. If we go to the next chart, and we understand this. So we've just read in Revelation there are 12 foundations, yeah? Remember, we've been looking through all this book, and we've kept saying everything's in sevens, but now everything's in twelves. So what is a foundation? Because we've got these lists of 12 foundations and we've got the, the names of the apostles and we've got the, the precious stones, we've looked at the gates and other aspects of the 12. What is a foundation? I mean, what is it? Have you got one? Has your house got a foundation? Have you got a foundation? If we want to understand, it's easy to read it and assume we know what a foundation is. So we've just read there 12 foundations. But if we want to really know what the foundation of God's city is, it would be good to look at what God says is a foundation. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah? Am I being logical? Yes. So if we look at what God says a foundation is, then we might have a good idea of what God's foundations mean and what they are. Guess how many times the word foundation is mentioned in the New Testament? Twelve. What a surprise. What a strange coincidence. In the New Testament, there are 12 things that are called foundations of our faith. Well, of course there is, because there's 12 foundations in the city of God. So God's going to give us illumination and understanding as to what these are. Right? They're not just shiny jewels. It's not what they look like. It's their functionality. Yeah? So let's look at the 12 foundations. Don't bring it up yet. Can anyone guess what the first foundation is? It, it really is not a trick question. Yeah, someone said it, Jesus. Yeah? Go to 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. So Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. They seem to have forgot their foundation, which means you're going to fall down. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. By the grace God has given me, grace, gift. Who's Paul? An apostle. He's a grace, gift to the church. They weren't respecting him or accepting him. They weren't even listening to him, but he was the best thing God had given them other than Jesus himself. I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. Let's read down. For no one can lay 
any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation of everything you have, will ever have, is Jesus. Can we all agree that? Yes. If anyone disagree with that one, forget studying everything else. We need to come back to the beginning. If you've not got Jesus, you have no foundation. You have nothing. You don't know the Bible. You don't know what it means. Because it's Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the foundation of everything you've ever had, will have, and have got right now. The important thing to understand about these foundations is it's no good waiting to the city of God to figure out whether you've got them. You've got to have them now by faith. The reality is coming in a greater um, magnification to what we have now, but you've got to have it now. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, precious stones, you can't just build precious stones and say, well, I... Remember, they're the foundations. You can't build your own foundations. Only God can. You can't build what you want. You can't just add bits to the church because you think it's a good idea. No, Jesus picked the 12 apostles. Jesus lays the foundation. So Christ is the cornerstone. Jesus is the foundation. If you build on this foundation with anything else, verse 13... Their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of every person's work. The city of God, the precious stones, are the ones that have lasted through the fire. Remember that the, the old heavens and earth has been dissolved with fire. But the new heavens and earth comes through that fire. You can, you can put a blowtorch to a diamond, it won't change it. It's already withstood it. Christ is the foundation. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Your confession is Jesus Christ, right? It's Christ in you that's the hope of glory. It's you in him. It's his word in you. It's your faith in him, and it's your faith built on him. He is the supreme foundation. Without that, you've got nothing. Whatever other foundation you think you've got, think you've got Bible knowledge, no good without Jesus, okay? Go back to the chart then. Next foundation that the Bible says is a foundation. I'm just making these up. We're looking at them systematically through the Bible. So first one, first foundation, Christ himself. Second one, the word of God. Yeah? You can't have the word of God if you've not got Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. But if you've got Jesus then, then you will start to understand what God's word is. Can you go to Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. So here's Jesus. Now he says this in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew as well. So this is the foundation of his kingdom. He's talking about the principles of the kingdom. He's laying the foundation. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? What's first foundation? Confessing Jesus is Lord. Yeah? I've laid my foundation. Hold on a minute. Don't just say Lord, Lord, if you're not going to do what he says. Lord isn't a title. It's a relationship you have with him. It means he's your boss. He's your king. He's your Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Let's read down. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid their foundation on the rock. Yeah? When the flood came, the torrent struck, when the judgment of God came, that house could not that, that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. The city of God is the city, it's the house that Jesus has built on the right foundation that goes through anything that attacks it. Just read down. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. Now in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, it says built on sand. 
Luke says it's the one who builds without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed. Its destruction was complete. Your foundation is not just, oh, I believe in Jesus. Don't say, Lord, Lord, but don't do what I say. Your foundation is obedience to what God's word says. That is a foundation. You are reading God's word, but you are putting it into practice. You are obeying it. Yeah? Christ, what he says. It's a foundation. It's not an option. You can't say he's Lord if you don't do what he says. Let's go back to the chart then. wonder what the third one is. We've already mentioned it. Bring it down. The apostles. Yeah? Let's go there, Ephesians 2.20. So, you believe in Jesus, you read his word. Now, some Christians think, well, that's all I need. No, it isn't. There's other foundations you've got to have in your life. Okay? The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Of course, Jesus is the supreme foundation. Everything's built on him. But you've got to have other people, other grace gifts that God puts into the church so the church has a proper foundation. Because if we don't accept the apostles or the people that Jesus gives, whether well, there's a fivefold ministry gift, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, if you reject those, you lose your foundation. Because they are foundations. They're foundational charismata. They are gifts of grace that Jesus gives to his church. And we've just looked that gift, grace, gift, gift of God is the main theme of Jesus when he handpicks people to build his church. Yeah? That's a foundation. Unfortunately, today we've got so many people in the church, they think they've got a ministry, but they've got no leaders. They've got no apostles, they've got no pastors, they've got no teachers, they just do what they want with it. They're people without a foundation. Whatever they're doing is going to fall over. It's not going to work. Foundational gifts. Okay, back to, well, it says it there, so we don't need to go back. Not just apostles, next one, but it says there prophets. So it's giving us a clue of the, the Ephesians, what we call the Ephesians 4.11 ministry gifts, apostles and prophets and, and the other three. But I think it's, it's emphasizing something a little bit more here. Because the apostles are what were appointed in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, God, once he'd built the kingdom, he, he, he established prophets. And I think what God's word is really showing us here, let me give you an example. Matthew 5, verse 17. Let's go there. Matthew 5, verse 17. So the prophets are also called foundations. So Jesus here, and this is where he's talking about laying the foundations. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Now, what does he mean there by prophets? It's not a trick question. If you went to a Jew of that time and said, I believed in the prophets, who were they believing in? Yeah, the Old Testament. The prophets, there's the law, the law of Moses, and then there's the prophets, the parts of the Old Testament. So the apostles are clearly the New Testament, because it's the apostles who write the New Testament. But it's the prophets who wrote the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. The law was written by Moses, but Moses was a prophet. And so I think what is clearly being emphasized here, if you just go to verse 18, it just adds strength to that. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear... Not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will, will disappear. Where? From the law and the prophets. So I think what we're being shown here of what is a foundation is the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah? The apostles and the prophets. John the Baptist was the greatest of the prophets because he was the last in the line of the Old Testament. So he's called a prophet. So I think what God's showing us here is your foundation is God's word all of it. Not the bits you like. Not the bits that you say, ah, oh, well, that's Old Testament. Because we're getting that a lot. 
especially in the areas of redefining things. Because God defines what his perfect order is in the Old Testament primarily. And Jesus says, we agree with this. But then because Jesus doesn't repeat it all, people say, oh, well, Jesus never said that. Oh, yes, he did. He says, you better agree with what the prophets said. In other words, the Old Testament. So we've got the Old Testament and the New Testament, but these are gifts. They are the ministry gifts of Christ, because that's what we've just seen their names are, and it tells us that in, uh, in Ephesians. So let's go back to the church ch chart. Does anyone know what the next one might be? I accidentally just said it then by mistake. Yes. The church. Obvious. Because you can see there's a logical flow to this. Right? God's foundation is Jesus Christ. Through his word. By his apostles and prophets. Through his church. Let's go to it. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. Now remember, that there's 12 things called foundations in the New Testament. And there's 12 foundations. So it has to be linked to this, because God doesn't mix up his metaphors. He doesn't mix up the words. If he says these are foundations, then they're foundations. There's precious stones and names of the apostles and all that. But these are the foundations God is telling us about. So if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So what's God saying here? If I'm delayed, if I don't come as fast as you think I'm coming, you know what to do. What do you do? You go to church. Yeah? You know how to conduct yourselves in God's household. Well, you don't if you're not a part of God's household, do you? Do you? How do you know how to conduct yourself if you don't go to church? The church is the household of God. You don't know how to behave in anyone's house unless you go to that house, do you? You know when you go to someone's house for the first time, you're not quite sure what you can and can't do, are you? Do you take your shoes off or don't you? Do you sit down or you wait to be asked? Do you hang your coat up or do you let them hang it up for you? What do you do? Look at you all acting as though you know. I, I never know what to do. Now, when you go to the cultures, it's really confusing because you go to different countries and, like, you do something that's really offensive and you didn't even know it. Sometimes you just stand there going, I don't know what to do. Well, they give you something to eat and you don't know what to do with it. Do I eat that? You know how to conduct yourselves. You know what to do. Oh, no, I'm saved. I believe in Jesus. I believe his word. I believe the Old Testament. I believe the New Testament. I think I'm an apostle. Well, that's not the point. Do you go to church? Are you a part of the household of God? Because it's the church that's the foundation of the truth. The city of God, the bride of Christ, is the church. Yeah, without the church, you haven't got a foundation. And the Bible assumes we know that. Well, you know what to do, don't you? Well, unfortunately, a lot of Christians today appear, appear not to know what to do. They don't appear to know that they are a part of the church and that they are built on that foundation. Without that foundation... We're in real trouble. Okay, let's go to the next one. So, they're all pretty logical. Now, here's the next one. A good life. Is that a foundation? Well, God says it is. Let's go to it. 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6, verse 18. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves, precious stones, as a firm foundation for the coming age. If you want to be in this city, then you've got to recognize this foundation should be happening now in your life because you're laying up a firm foundation of what is to come for the coming age, right? If you've not got this foundation now, why do you think you'll have it in the future? It's not magic. All these foundations you're supposed to have now. You believe in Jesus now, yeah? You're part of the church now, yeah? You believe his word now, yeah. Just because it's all going to be true in the new city, in the heavenly realm that we're all going to, you've got to have that foundation now. If you reject that now, why do you think it's going to happen in the future? 
It's not going to happen. It's like the dishes. You've got to do them now. Actually, I found if you ignore them, they do themselves. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Throw your socks on the floor. Don't worry, they'll get picked up by somebody. <laughs> it's nothing like that at all. You've got to do it now. Your life is happening right now. Now, if you've got all these other things in place, if Christ is your foundation and you believe in his word and you've got these things, then that affects the way you live. If it doesn't, I question whether you've got that as a foundation. I question whether you've got any of the other foundations, to be honest. If your life has not changed since you believed in Christ and you read his word and you believed in the apostles and prophets and you're a part of the church, stuff better have changed in your life. Or oh, the foundations are not very good. They're very shaky. We're saved. We belong to Jesus Christ. Our life changes. Yeah? Next one then. Number seven. Twelve foundations. Twelve things wrapped up as foundations. God's choice. As I say, I'm not making these up. These are what are stated in God's word. Let's go to this one then. Second Timothy 2. Verse 19. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, see what Paul's writing in 2 Timothy, everything seems to have gone wrong. He actually says all the, he says all the, all the, all the churches in Asia have deserted him. Uh, he's he's going to die. He's accepted that now. He says, my, my departure is at hand. He's in prison. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. God's solid foundation is this. Now, you might have all the others. You might think, I believe in Jesus, Solid foundation. I believe in God's word. Solid foundation. I believe the teaching of the apostles and prophets, the Old Testament, the New Testament, but the grace gifts of pastors and leaders and teachers that God gives me. I'm, I'm in fellowship with them. I believe in God's holy church. I believe all that. I, I believe I should live a good life and there should be fruit of my life. I believe all that. Even despite all that, everything might still go wrong. And you might think, my foundations have gone. No. God's foundation is that God knows you belong to him. You need that foundation. You need to know your foundation is not based on you picking God. It's God picking you. The 12 apostles were picked by God. One of them blew it, betrayed him, turned away from him. But the others were grace gifts. They were picked by Jesus. Jesus says, you didn't pick me. I chose you to bear fruit and fruit that will last. You need to know in your life, you need to have this as a solid foundation. God knows you belong to him. He's yours. He takes ownership of you. Yes, you need to know you belong to God. But by faith, you do that. No, you need to have this solid foundation. God is not going to let go of you. That is your stronghold. Even when you mess up and get things wrong, if you confess your love and faith in Jesus Christ, he keeps hold of you. The Lord knows those who are his. Paul is probably undergoing more stress than he's ever gone through in his life, and he's going to be executed. But he knows he belongs to God because God knows Paul. God picked Paul. Paul didn't pick God. You are chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And so it's important that you have that as a foundation of your faith because if you don't, you'll collapse when terrible things happen. But when you know God holds you, you don't hold him. When you know 
God has chosen you and God knows who you are and God picked you and God knows that you belong to him. When you know that as a certainty, your foundation is solid. I'm not holding on to God. He's holding on to me. He picked me. It's that assurance. It's that rest that we heard about this morning. It's that solidity. It's that confidence, that sure and certain hope that God's in control. Because you can imagine if you've planted all these churches like Paul and then they're, they're all turning away, you think I've lost control. No, I, he hasn't lost control. All the churches in Asia de de deserted Paul. Paul must have thought all that work and now they've, they've kicked out their own pastor and they're not even listening to their own apostle. No, John's going to write a letter to them from Jesus in Revelation to the churches in Asia. Jesus is going to put them straight and some of them are not going to be happy about it when he deals with them. Okay, so foundation but also everyone who com confesses the name of the lord must turn away from wickedness so we would have a name for that go back to the chart yes the next one mentioned there in 2 timothy 2 the foundation of repentance yeah but it's not just mentioned in to Timothy, it's mentioned as one of the foundations of the Christian faith in Hebrews chapter 6. Let's go there. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance. So repentance is a foundation. Yeah? Yeah? The, the repentance from acts that lead to death. So, repentance is a law in operation in your life. It's a foundational law. It never moves. Repentance isn't just something you did. Now, you have to repent. You can't be a Christian without repenting. And baptism is a, is a symbol of repentance as well as other things. But repentance from acts that lead to death. When you find out something you are doing in life is causing death in your life, you better repent from that. However much you may have legitimized it before and said it's okay and I think God allows it and I've got away with it, if you realize it's causing death, if you realize it's causing spiritual death, psychological death, physical problems, you turn from it. Yeah? Yeah? If you realize a, a, a friendship you've got with someone that's leading to death, you turn away from that. You remove yourselves from that situation. You repent from it. Now, here in Hebrews, we've got the, in Hebrews chapter 6, we've got the other foundations that are mentioned. When Jesus writes to the seven churches in Asia, in Revelation, we studied this at the beginning, seven times he says repent to churches, not unbelievers, Seven times to churches, he says, repent, therefore, and do what you should be doing or do what you did at first. Repentance must never be removed from the church. It's a foundation. We continually turn away from things when we realize they are wrong. We may do things in ignorance. We may do things that just habits, culture, traditions. But when you realize that that is leading to death, you turn from it. You do not justify it, or it, the foundation will go, and it will become shaky, okay? So the next one is actually listed there. So we've got the foundations here, the foundation of repentance and the foundation of faith in God. Now, that's the first foundation you have, faith in Christ, yeah? But faith doesn't go. It's not just faith in Christ, it's the continual life of faith is the foundation of your life. It, it can't disappear. You will, you will never get to a point where you're okay. Have you figured that out? Because as you advance in Christian life and as you grow and as you know God's word, all the foundations, you know the Old Testament, you know the New Testament, you attend church, you know how to be, behave in God's household, you have faith in Christ, all these things, and you think, yeah, I'm, I'm growing. And, and you sort of get to a point, it's like, when can I start to coast? <laughs> when, when am I okay? Do you know what I mean? You do know what I mean. 
You know, when I, how many times do I have to go to church? How much, how much of the Bible do I need to read? How much do I need to... When do I get to the point where I've done enough? I have this argument all the time with the Lord. It's like, when have I done enough, Lord? When can I leave? When can I retire? When can I go buy a chalet in Menorca or, you know, and put my feet up and go fishing or go to sky? You know, when, when can I take life easy? When can I have to stop living by faith all the time? Stop having to believe for, like, God's miracle for the next thing? Never. Never. And if you really understand faith, you understand that's the safest place to be. Because the minute you step out of faith and into your own abilities to keep yourself and into your own abilities through your own works and your own achievements and your own attainments and your own success, whatever that is, the minute you step into that, your foundation goes. Our foundation is from faith to faith. And it's a foundation there. The foundation of faith in God. And faith in God is not about your feelings in God. It's about your assured confession and lifestyle of obedience in God. I don't feel good about this. I'd rather not do it. But my faith in God dictates I have to do this and follow him, as we heard this morning. Yeah? Right, next one. Um, so we've got their repentance faith. Now, these are all called foundations in Hebrews 6. Next one is baptisms. Um, if you go back to Hebrews 6, go into the King James, because the NIV does something a bit naughty here. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2. If you go into the, the NIV, the old NIV didn't do this. The new NIV does. There we go. The, the, the new NIV tries to give the meaning of what the word baptism means and calls it a cleansing rite, but it doesn't say that. It says baptism. Um, they're trying to give you the thought-for-thought thought understanding rather than the word-for-word word understanding. So a foundation of your life, the doctrine of baptisms, s with an S at the end, right? Foundational in your life is baptisms. Now, the entrance uh, into the Christian life of repentance was baptism in water, yeah? But it doesn't say baptism. It says baptisms. So it's at least two. For there to be a sit on it, there's got to be two. Uh, but there could be more than two. So the doctrine of baptisms, now the two essential ones they would have known straight away was obviously the baptism in water, which is repentance, which we've already looked at. And the second what baptism is? The baptism in the Holy Spirit. Yeah? Now that Greek word, ba baptizo, ba ba baptism, it's an untranslated word, we use it today. It literally means to be submerged into something. Yeah? You are plunged into something so that it covers all of you. That's what the word means. So when you are baptized into water, you are put under the water. So you are literally in the water and the water's in you. Yeah? So baptism and repentance and death, all that's what that means. I'm not going to go into all the doctrine of baptism in water now. But secondly, what the apostles emphasize, you remember when Paul met the Ephesian church and he says, what baptism did you receive? And they said, baptism of John, the, the water baptism of repentance. He says, oh, that, that's good. That's repentance. But have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And they says, no, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Now, that might sound weird, but unfortunately, there's a lot of churches like that today. They, they, know, they knew theologically there's a Holy Spirit. I mean, you can't read the Bible without knowing that. They knew there was a, uh, the, the Ruach of God, the, the, the Holy Spirit of God, but they didn't know there was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism, the doctrine of baptisms, mean you are engulfed, sub submerged, overwhelmed by, and in something. And that thing is in you. And so when they're told, baptism into God's spirit, yes. Oh, I'm not so sure about that. 
It's a foundation. It's not an option. It doesn't say here, let's go through the options of the Christian life again. You know, singing choruses or hymns, having a guitar or an organ. No, it's not options. Tea or coffee, biscuits or cake. No, these are foundations. The foundation of the church is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his church, stay in Jerusalem until you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Don't try anything else. Don't go and do evangelism. Don't try doing church work. Stay in Jerusalem until you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, until you, until you receive the power from on high, until the fire comes upon you. Until you get that, you haven't got a right foundation. It doesn't mean you're not saved. You're saved through believing in Jesus. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, unfortunately, in some churches today, it's almost like, an option, isn't it? Would you like to receive the Holy Spirit? It's like that. You may as well say, would you like to breathe? <laughs> what do you mean, would you like to receive the Holy Spirit? That's the point of existence. That's what Jesus came to give you. Jesus says the Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father. The Spirit is going to be poured out. That's the prophecies of what all the prophets in the Old Testament said. In the last days, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. You'll prophesy. The men, the women, the old, the young, the, the maidservants, the manservants, slave, free. You can receive the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No Christian should leave the house until they know they've got that. That should be the main thing in their life if you haven't got that. But it is a process. You can't assume you've got the Holy Spirit. That's deadly. No, you've got to know all these foundations. You've got to know there's a foundation there. I used to work for the, the local council and I was um, in, worked for building control and... Um, inspection and we before any house was built you had to go and inspect the foundation they weren't when once a builder had laid the foundations he had to sit and wait until the the building control inspector came and checked the foundation and once the foundation was sure then you'd say right you can start building you can build the walls and you, you can put the services in you can do everything but you can't do that till you've got the foundation until you've got the holy spirit active in your life just stop don't try and do anything much for God without him. Because he's the power, he's the dunamis that empowers everything that needs doing. Without him, we're going to be pretty fruitless. Yeah? It doesn't mean you won't be saved. You're saved through faith in Christ. You see, what a lot of Christians do, they twist scripture and they make out it's just all one thing. Oh, when you believe, if you, did you believe in Jesus? Did you, or did you read the Bible? All right, well, you've already got the Holy Spirit then. No, that isn't what Jesus says. That isn't what the apostles said. They'd go to a church and find believers who were reading the Bible and they'd say, have you got the Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? It is a foundational aspect. It's the Holy Spirit that takes John to the new Jerusalem. At once he was in spirit. Well, what if he hadn't got the Holy Spirit? Well, then he might not have got there. It's the Holy Spirit who raptures the church the Holy Spirit who takes the church into God's presence. Foundational, essential necessity. Without him, we are lost. Okay, next one then. So, baptisms. The laying on of hands. Now, do you think of that as a foundation? You see, some of us, especially charismatics, that's something you get from a man of God at a charismatic conference, isn't it? You know, you go to a special conference and someone puts his hands on you, shouts fire, you fall on the floor and shake, and that's it. You've had the laying on of hands, but that isn't what it means. The laying on of hands, it's a foundation, an essential requirement, but the laying on of hands was done in lots of different situations, and I'm not going to go through them all. Jesus would often lay his hands on people. The, pro the, the apostles would lay their hands on people for certain things. The important thing to understand about the laying on of hands is 
that you are a foundation. It, this is a foundation. You are connected with someone who you are in submission to. You are under the authority. You are in a relationship with people. You're not your own foundation. You've got to be linked with others. So people would lay hands. So before anyone was ever commissioned for any work or ministry for God, the leaders would lay hands on them. They would say, we are in partnership with this. You cannot launch yourself and lay your own foundation. That's what Paul's told the Corinthians. He's saying, you're just doing your own thing. Oh, well, I, I think I'm anointed for this. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters, has someone put their hand on that and authorized it? The laying on of hands, the impartation of gifts, healing comes through laying on of hands. But the point is, it's through a connectivity. You know, when someone touches you, if you don't know that person, you don't like it, do you? It's a bit, well, I don't. You know, if you're just walking down the street and a stranger comes up to you and goes, what do you do? You say, get off you weirdo. <laughs> Who are you? But if it's someone you're in relationship with, it's like, yeah, thank you. Pat on the back, shaking the hand, give them a hug, whatever. That, it's the symbolism of what laying on of hands is. It's impartation of gifting or healing or uh, whatever grace gift the Holy Spirit might want to give to us. It's a recognition of authority. Receiving the right hand of fellowship into the membership of the church. It's this a relational, amenable, accountable partnership that you are now in. That has to be a foundation in your life. You can't be a lone ranger. You can't say, I'm anointed and I've got a gift and I've got a ministry. It doesn't work like that. It works through the connectivity and relational activity of the church, the body of Christ. And that's a foundation. You can't move that. You can never launch out on your own. That, that's not in the Bible. When Paul and Barnabas were called by God to launch to the ministry of the Gentiles, the whole church, the leaders, had to put their hands on them, lay hands on them, and commission them for the ministry. And if you haven't got that, you haven't got the blessing of God over it. Even sons in the Bible had to get the blessing of the Father. They couldn't just assume, well, I'm a son, I can do what I want. No. Laying on of hands. There has to be the impartation of that blessing, authority, and everything that means. And the last one then, uh, the eternal things. If you go to Hebrews chapter 6, so the, the, the eternity, obviously, it, this covers a number of issues, but it's summed up in... Uh, what we could call the eternal things. So you've got the baptism, the laying of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and the eternal judgment. The understanding as a foundation in your life that what is important is eternity. Now, a lot of Christians have they've removed this foundation. Have they made the Christian life a source of temporal blessing? It's all about what you can achieve now. It's all about doing stuff through politics. It's all about doing stuff that makes you rich and successful and business-minded and how to achieve stuff. That is not a foundation. The foundation is what lasts for eternity. The foundation is the foundation that we've just seen in, in Revelation chapter 21. You must not ever lose your focus on your eternal destination. Because you are going to be judged. There is going to be a resurrection. There is a heaven and there is a hell. There is a judgment throne. There is a giving an account of everything you've ever said and ever done. These are foundational beliefs. You cannot move them. You can't just say, I don't believe in hell. I don't think there is such a place. It's a foundation. God stated it. Jesus talked as much about heaven, uh, as much about hell as he did heaven. In fact, he talked more about hell than he did heaven. These are real things. It is not about your temporal life now. Do not make that a foundation. Yes, we've got to live life now. Yes, we've got to work and look after our families and be um, 
financially prudent. All these things we've got to do, but they're not foundations. The foundation is eternity. Because that's going to happen. Everything else is temporal. Do not lose sight of that. Okay? Right then. Um, I think we're going to finish a bit earlier tonight, quicker than we normally do. Because um, I'm not going to get on to aspects of eternity. Um, I'll just look at something else, and we'll look at that next time. So, we've looked that there's 12 foundations, yeah? There's 12 foundations, there's 12 apostles, there's 12 tribes, there's all the 12s that we've been looking about, looking at. Um, but we've looked at throughout the Bible in Revelation, through this study, we've looked at how everything's in sevens. And now we're looking at how everything's in twelves. Now, we have mentioned this before, but you'll probably have noticed that throughout the Bible, seven and twelve are often connected together. Um, so, let me give you an example. Jesus, without having to turn to scriptures, because you'll know this is true, Jesus picked 12 apostles, yeah? And the church was built, yeah? So when the church needed to add workers to the church, they picked deacons. How many did they pick? Seven. So can you see, Jesus picks 12, and if you read it in Acts chapter 6, it's the church that picked the deacons. Yeah? Just be clear about that. Jesus picked the apostles. Jesus says, you haven't chosen me, I chose you. Have I not chosen you, the twelve, he said. But when it came to the seven, the church picked them. Read it there in Acts chapter 6. And the apostles... Now, there had to be very strict criteria for them to be picked. They had to be full of the Spirit. They had to know the Bible. They had to have all the foundations in place, in other words. Then the apostles laid hands on them, and they took responsibility within the church. But you can see there are two uh, groups of people, one number 12 and one number 7, because that's what God's planning the church on earth is always linked to the number seven. Now, we've looked at that over and over again, so you should know that by now. Eternity in heaven is linked to the number 12. Government on earth is linked to the number seven. Government in heaven is linked to the number 12. So when you find the seven and the 12 coming together, Jesus is showing us, God is showing us through his word, that there's a connection between the heavenly management and government and the earthly management and government, and they meet in the church. And you find this throughout the Bible. So in the temple, when you went into the, the holy place, the priest was to uh, place 12 pieces of bread for the 12 tribes. Yeah? The show bread, the bread of the presence. And he would put that on the golden table. But then he would light the menorah, the golden candlestick. How many lamps? Seven. So can you see he's doing two things? One's seven and one's 12. So which one's the most important? They're both essential. Yeah, one's representing the, the 12 tribes, the bread. And the other one, the seven lamps. Now in Revelation chapter one, it says the seven lamps are the seven churches. So you've got the symbolism of seven and 12 meeting together in the holy place. So this is why the seven now is giving way to the 12, because everything's coming together. But you'll find it over and over again. So Jesus fed the multitude twice. But each time, the first time and the second time, there was a different number of baskets left over. And Jesus asked his apostles, how many baskets were left over? Can you remember? And they went, 12. And he says, what about the other time? How many baskets were left over? And they went, seven. And he says, don't you understand? And they all went, yeah. 
I'll see you on the mount. What difference does it make how many baskets there were left over? It's the number. Yeah? Seven and twelve coming together. Seven and twelve coming together. And yet, so you'll find this. When the Israelites went to Egypt, yeah? Twelve springs, seventy palm trees. You've got the, the, the multiples of seven and the multiples of twelve coming together. It, it, it's a way of showing earth and heaven coming together. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. It's, it's God's numeric way of showing how this all works. So there's 12 months of a year, in a year, yeah? But how many days in a week? Seven and 12, you see. But, but on a lunar cycle, um, it's 28 days, and then there's the two strange days where no one knows where the moon is, so it's 30 days, So, because it's just over seven, seven point something. So you've got the seven and 12 working on this, the solar and lunar cycles, heaven and earth coming together, seven and 12. And so you find this throughout the Bible, seven and 12 coming together. So Moses uh, saved, delivered Israel from destruction. So he saves 12 tribes, yeah? You read it there in Exodus. Yeah, but before he saves 12 tribes, he saves seven brides. You remember the story where the, the seven daughters of Jethro were drawing water and the shepherds came and drove them away and Moses chased them off and saved the seven brides. The seven churches were saved before the 12 tribes. But, but in the whole context, Moses then brings them back to his bride. So you've got seven and 12 coming together. The bride and Israel coming together. Seven and twelve, heaven and earth. You've got all these pictures throughout the Bible, and there's others, but we'll not go into it. We've got this principle of seven and twelve coming together all the time, yeah? So, if we go to Hebrews 11 and verse 10. So, we've seen that the word foundation is mentioned 12 times in the New Testament. There's 12, oh, there's 12 foundations. And there's the 12 stones and all the things are 12. But in, in Hebrews, and we looked at this in detail in the city of God, it says uh, Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now, if you remember when we looked at this in the city of God, I said that's a bit of a strange statement. He's looking forward to a city with foundations. Well, who's looking forward to a city without foundations? I mean, it seems a superfluous statement. Why would you say that? You know, if you're buying a house, you wouldn't come in and say, Dave, I'm going to buy a house with foundations. I would say, good. I'm glad you're buying a house with foundations. I said, I'm buying a car with wheels and an engine. Good. They're the best kind of cars. Yeah, obviously, you, 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 a city with foundations. But you see, nothing in God's word is there by accident. What foundations? Well, you've got the 12 we just looked at. Yeah, but in the context here in Hebrews, he's not talking about those uh, foundations. Here in Hebrews, he's just given, God has just given us a list of principles of faith that are linked here in verse 10 and 11 to the city of God with foundations. So Abraham was moving towards this city. Guess what? So are you. You're moving towards this city with foundations. So God's emphasizing the foundations, the foundational element of this city. Now, in the context here, this is, the, con or this is the, the point of what he's just said. So if we go back, go back to verse um, 3. Verse 3. So it just so happens that here in Hebrews 11, when it says that 
He was looking forward to this city with foundations, which I hope you are, because that's where you're going. And you look forward to somewhere you're going, hopefully, if it's your eternal home. There's seven aspects of faith that lead us to this city with foundations. Now, I don't believe anything in the Bible is there by accident. Now, we read this as the, you know, the, the, the attributes of faith by faith we leave God. But I wonder if there's more being shown here than we've first understood. Let me just read it till we get back to where we were. In the city, by faith... Now, this is the great chapter of faith, but this is the first time it's describing things. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Next one. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. And now we get back to what we just read about the city with foundations. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. I'll just read one more. By faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promises. Right, let me just stop there. I'm sure you've read this chapter many times. And you've read about the people there who are commended for their faith. Have you ever wondered why only certain people are picked in this list? Because the goal is the city with foundations. And so could it be that God is showing us because the seven things there we've just read, or seven people, or seven aspects of faith, that are stressed and declared as important, I would say essential, to attain to this city that has foundations. I don't think they've just picked seven things out of the blue. Because there's hundreds of things you could pick in the Bible about faith. In the Old Testament, there's hundreds of examples. But there's these seven that are picked. Could it be that what God is showing us is a pattern through this faith of how we get to this city with foundations? I think it could be because that's what the goal is. And then that's what's described as is necessary by faith to move towards this city with foundations. And so, what was the first thing that's mentioned there? Just go back to verse 3. Now, the first thing, by faith, we understand, you know, that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. So we know by faith that God started everything. 
created everything, created the universe in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah? By faith, you know that. You've got to know it by faith. Do you know why? No one was there except God. Right? Scientists now do believe there was a beginning, but they didn't use it until they had the proof. So now they've got the proof, but they still don't know. They weren't there. By faith we know that. So from the beginning, Genesis 1, the creation of Adam in the Garden of Eden, to Abraham moving towards the city and Sarah having the promised son, there's 2,000 years. There's, there's, there's 2,000 years. If you work out the genealogies and the, and the lifespan. So from the creation, there's 2,000 years until they move towards the city of God that has foundations. Now in Christ, we're a new creation. And guess what? There's been 2,000 years. Almost. Almost. We've probably got another seven or eight years till it's 2,000 years. But we're not looking forward to the last seven years of this age. Because that's the great tribulation. And so could God actually by picking these specific things by faith, showing us the pattern of his people that are going to the city of God. Because it's the city with foundations. I think this is the pattern. So the first, if we go back to that chart, please, the first thing that we see, next chart, is that there's seven Foundations or seven steps towards Sarah having the promised child. And it's, it's described in the words as the city with foundations. Right? Step number one, by faith, the creation of everything. Now the heavens and the earth are going to pass away. Jesus is bringing a new creation. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old has gone, the new has come. So the first stage in this seven-step foundational process is that God is going to create everything new, not the old creation. In fact, just go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In Christ, we are born again. He's the firstborn. In Christ, you're a new creation. God starts his creation process again. If it took 2,000 years last time, perhaps it's going to, until Abraham got to the city of God, perhaps it's going to be 2,000 years this time. Just go down. For in him, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. If you ever want to understand how wonderful Jesus is, read this. Just go down. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the first form from among the dead. So in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. One more verse. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So the creation of all things in the original creation and in the new creation is to bring everything together. This is what the new Jerusalem is. Everything on heaven, everything in earth. He is the one who's brought it all together. He's the head of the body, which is his bride, which is the city of God. Jesus is bringing it all together. Yeah, By faith, we know that. When did he start that process? 2,000 years ago. Now, I know he started it before the foundation of the world and the whole Bible's about that. But the church, he's bringing it all together through his church, started on the day of Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit came and the church was born. Yeah? So, first stage. Yeah? Go back to the chart. Second stage. Foundational understanding. Abel is killed. A righteous man has to die. 
Abel is the one who brought the acceptable sacrifice. So at the beginning of the new creation, the one who is righteous has to die. The one who brings the acceptable sacrifice has to die. The evil one, Cain, who is a type of antichrist, the Bible tells us that Cain was of the evil one, he's going to be the one who comes to power. Well, that's exactly what happens in the new creation. Jesus begins his new creation. Jesus is the righteous one who brings the acceptable sacrifice, and he's the one who has to die. And it's the evil one who seems to win. It's the evil one that seems to get and build his own city. Cain built his own city. What about the city of God? Oh, God's building the city of God. It's just he's going to take 2,000 years to do it. And so we see a very clear pattern being established. And it says that Abel still speaks. Jesus died. No, Jesus is alive. He's still speaking. He's the word. And so we see that this is a pattern. Cain is going to set up a false system. There's going to be a false antichrist system running the world. But God is going to set up the city of God, the new Jerusalem, the kingdom of heaven. Okay. So what happens next in what we just read? Go down. Rapture. By faith, Enoch is taken away. So he was not. Why do some Christians not believe in the rapture? I, I don't understand it. You know, some Christians will say, well, I believe in the resurrection, not the rapture. Okay, how many people are resurrected in the Bible? Seven. How many people are raptured in the Bible? Seven. Why do you believe in a resurrection and not a rapture? By faith, Enoch was taken away. When was he taken? Before God's judgment came on the world. God told Enoch, do you know what Enoch, Enoch means? One who teaches, one who teaches God's word. He prophesied, he named his son Methuselah. He says, you've got another thousand years, then when he dies it shall come. That's what Methuselah means. But before God's judgment came on the world, Enoch was raptured out of the world. He was taken away to God. Now, if this is a pattern which it would appear to be, because this is what Jesus is doing, then that's going to happen as well. Yeah? If Jesus is bringing a new creation, and he's the creation of all things that we've just read in, in Colossians, and if he's the righteous one who died and brought the acceptable sacrifice, and if Antichrist, Cain, is building his own city, which is an evil system of Babylon and slavery, then the next thing that's going to happen is those who do belong to God are going to be taken away. If God's following his own system, if God's following his own pattern, and God gave us these examples in this order, yeah? So what's the next thing that happened? The earth was judged. The flood came. Tribulation. The wrath of God landed on the planet. Not until Enoch had been taken away, though. And so the judgment of God came by faith, Noah, when warned of the judgment to come, built an ark. People were still protected during the judgment of God by faith. Yeah? People were still saved. Noah went through the tribulation. By faith, he condemned the world. Noah did. Noah says, I'm having nothing to do with this world. I am building an ark for my family. I know what's going on. I've, just, I've seen Enoch. I've seen Methuselah. I know what's going on. I'm going to save my family. So after the rapture of Enoch, the next thing we are told, it don't, it, oh, there's, there's millions of people in between those two people, and it never mentions them. The next thing it mentions is this. The judgment of God coming on earth, wiping everything off the planet except the few that still believed in him. Yeah? Tribulation and judgment, and he saved the world. That is always God's method. It was the same method when he saved Lot out of Sodom. 
He says, get your family into this house, I'm taking you out. He didn't say, tomorrow start a leaflet campaign trying to change the political parties of Sodom. <laughs> what you need to do, Lot, is you need to go back in the city gate and you need to convince everyone in Sodom to change their policy on the definition of marriage act. He didn't say that, did he? He says, get your family in this house, I'm getting you out of here. What's going to happen to Sodom? You don't want to know what's going to happen to Sodom. There's going to be nothing left by tomorrow. That's the pattern of the Bible. And today, Christians, we don't... We, oh, oh, well, by faith, this is, the, this is the exact pattern God describes, right? And he misses all the other stuff out. There must be a logical reason for that. Next one, then. By faith, Abraham moves towards the city with foundations. He leaves Babylon, Ur of the Chaldees, and he moves towards what God wants. That is what we're doing. We're moving toward what God wants throughout this whole process. By faith, Abraham is doing that. You know the story of the Bible is the story of one family. Did you know that? The entire story from Genesis to Revelation is the story of one family. That's all it is. It's a family story. It's the story of the Jews. We're adopted into that family through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus has opened us in. But even before the Jews, it's still one family because it's still Adam to Noah and then Noah had Shem and then Shem the Semites had Abraham. Still one family. And so we are moving as a family to the Father's house. Yeah? So what's the next? The city of God. By faith, he moved towards the city that had foundations. That's the next stage. speaks of itself, it's evident, the city with foundations. Now, I don't believe for one minute this is just a coincidence that it's in this order and these are the only things mentioned and everything else is messed out. There's no one else mentioned, only these. Seven steps, but we've only looked at six. Yeah, because we read the seventh. Go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 11. Because... The final stage, Hebrews 11, verse 11. By faith, Sarah, who's Sarah? The bride. The f there's no other woman mentioned here. They're all men. Now there's a bride mentioned. Well, what have we just read in Revelation? Come, I will show you the bride, the city of God with foundations. That's the whole point. That's what we're moving towards. So what's the seventh aspect? Sarah gives birth to the promise. The bride is finally fulfilled at the city of when the city of God appears, looking forward to the city with foundations. So the city of God is the bride of Christ. It is the place with foundations. It is the place we are heading. Yes, there's going to be tribulation. Yes, Jesus had to die. Yes, Jesus is creating everything. Yes, there is going to be a rapture. Yes, there is going to be a massive judgment. Yes, these things are going to happen. But the city is certain. It has solid foundations. Those 12 we looked at, the 12 stones, the 12 apostles, the 12 tribes, the 12 aspects, but also the seven aspects of the church as to what we are and where we are going. We will obtain the promise if by faith we believe this. But you have got to believe it by faith and you have got to have those foundations in your life. So I think we'll leave it there and I think we'll just be strengthened in our faith knowing that God is going to do this and he's taking us to that city. Because we're his bride, and we're going to be fruitful, and we're going to inherit the promises, because God has promised, and faithful is he who has promised. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads then. Father, thank you that you are taking us to this city.
You said you went to the Father's house 2,000 years ago to prepare a place for us. And you said you will come back to take us to be where you are as your bride, to be fruitful and to inherit all the promises that you, through your grace, has gifted to us. So, Lord, thank you for all these aspects of this city. Now, Lord, let us by faith live for you this week, serve you, obey you, honour you, and follow you so that you can do what you want to do in our lives until it's time for you to take us to be with yourself. Lord, let your blessing rest upon your people. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you all.